Thank you so much for all of you for being here. My name is Serene. I am Senior Advisor at the Behavioral Insects team in Singapore. Um, we have a hard task today because we are fighting against your hunger pangs. So I appreciate all of you being here. Um, I'd like to tell this story of me presenting at a workshop last year in Hong Kong on a Saturday morning where 25 people were supposed to be signed up for my workshop. Um, eight people turned up um, and I, I tell myself that I was quite assured of eight people turning up because I was fighting against dim sum. Uh, in Hong Kong. If you know how much Hong Kong people love their Tim Sum, 8 out of 25 is pretty good. So thank you for more than 30% of you turning up. It makes me and the panelists feel great. So um, just to introduce to you the panelists today first before um, I open, we have um, Alvin. Alvin Ko. He is Senior Probation Officer from the Ministry of Social and Family Development in Singapore. Dr. Karen Tindall, who is Senior Advisor at the Behavioral Insects Team in Australia. We have Ms. Edwina Crawford, who is Director of Aboriginal Services from the New South Wales Government. And we have Eva Cormilas, who is from the Behavioural Insects Unit from the De Department of Premier and Cabinet in the New South Wales um, Government. So today's session is going to be a little bit different from what you might have experienced. I think over the past one and a half days, you've listened to researchers talk about their projects, talked about how they've run trials in real life. Um, and while it is inspiring, sometimes I think it you know, can also be a little bit intimidating, right? It's like, how do you actually run projects in real life? You work with vulnerable populations, work in complex environments. Um, and so this session actually today is, as the name suggests, tries to demystify a little bit of that project. Right? How does it mean, what does it mean to run um, trials in real life in sometimes environments that can be quite difficult? Um, these are, what we're going to talk to you about are uh, slightly less sexy bits of running a project, but these are also the, the, the really in, the important and integral parts of, of running projects in the real world. Um, and so we hope that this is more of a conversation. It is as much about us sharing our experiences as it is, we hope, you finding a bit of yourselves in what we are saying, um, sharing some of the challenges that you might have faced, um, some of the difficulties, but also, I think, um, in trying to find solutions for very real predicaments um, that we face while we're running trials in real life. Um, so just to give you a rundown of the structure, so I would like to be part of the social norm, the alleged 89% of people who finish sessions on time. So <laughs> I hope to have your cooperation. Once I have um, finished the opening remarks, we'll have Karen and the Australian team um, present to you their projects. We will then open for a short Q&A for about 10 minutes so you can ask specific questions specific to the Australian presentation. And then Elvin and I will then go on with the um, Singapore project and then we'll take questions again at the end and hopefully all of you can go for a prompt lunch at 1.15. Okay? All right, great. So without further ado, I will pass the lectern to Karen. It's very, very good to be here today and very exciting to talk about a project that's very close to all of our hearts. So I'm going to give you a, uh, a brief overview of the intervention and then I'll hand over to Edwina and Eva so they can talk you through the behind the scenes insights. Uh, so, uh, and it's also worth noting that they'll be talking through the implementation and design element because we are very excited to get results in mid next year. So I'm sorry if you were, were hoping to know whether it works or not. We are also hoping to know whether it works or not. So, uh, as we're all aware, domestic violence is a very serious uh, issue that has long term impacts on women, men, and children. Um, and so, over the past few years, our teams have been working together. Uh, to try and develop behavioural insights interventions to reduce domestic violence, or more specifically, to increase compliance with apprehended domestic violence orders. So an apprehended domestic violence order, an ADVO, is like a restraining order. It's a court-imposed order that tells a defendant what they can and can't do. So, for example, uh, they cannot contact the protected person, they can't go within 500 metres of their house, or if they're still living uh, with the protected person, they can't go home within 12 hours of drinking alcohol. Uh, so our job was to come up with interventions that would increase the likelihood that they would comply with these orders. Uh, and one of the, the many interventions uh, is what's your plan? Uh, so before designing the, the intervention, the team first spent a lot of time trying to understand the challenge. Uh, it was, when this project started in 2014, it was 
uh, an area that Behavioural Insights had not gone into before. So it deserved a lot of consideration. So the team spent a lot of time doing field work in rural and urban New South Wales, lots of research, interviews with perpetrators and victims of domestic violence, uh, interviews with a wide range of uh, frontline staff, visiting uh, courthouses, watching courthouse interactions, um, and understanding the issue. And a lot of insights emerged from this. One of the ones that kept coming up was that there was a lot of legalese in the proceedings, in the paperwork. The language was overwhelming and confusing and made it very hard to understand precisely what you could and couldn't do. Uh, and a number of ideas also emerged from this. And one of the ideas was that it would be a good opportunity for a planning conversation. So not only to talk through with the defendant what the order means, but also plan how they're going to comply with the orders, comply with the conditions. Uh, and there is very robust evidence for uh, planning conversations. So many of you may have heard of mental contrasting with implementation intentions. Yep, oh, I'm seeing nods, very good. You may also have heard of it. Uh, it's more commonly known as WHOOP, so, which stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, Plan. So if you want to set a goal and achieve a goal, you need to think about what your wish is, what would you like to achieve. You need to think about the outcome, what is the best thing that could come from achieving that goal. What are the obstacles that are likely to get in your way? And how do you plan to overcome or get around those obstacles? And while this idea had a lot of promise and we were really excited about it, we really had no idea how to make it work. So, I mean, you know, we had not heard of any uh, planning conversations like this that had happened in the context of domestic violence reoffending. We didn't know who was going to deliver the intervention. Uh, we didn't know what should go into the goal setting and planning conversation, or even in the context of compliance, what a uh, what a wish might look like. But then, then we were approached by the wonderful Edwina, who saw an opportunity. Uh, she is the director of the Aboriginal Services Unit. Uh, her team uh, has, is made up of uh, court support officers who are located in courts all over New South Wales. And they already had the job of supporting Aboriginal defendants in, to na help navigate through the court processes, to help with the administration. And so she saw the opportunity to harness this existing network. Uh, her team were already engaging with defendants, already discussing the orders, and a behaviourally informed conversation could really give structure to these interactions that were already happening. So this intervention is also a really nice example of iterating, testing, scaling. So we started by um, testing out the intervention with just seven of the court support officers over the course of one month. And we used their feedback, what they learned, to iterate and to change the conversation uh, and work with them to make it better. Uh, and then we were able to scale it up to uh, all the court support officers in the 46 courts across New South Wales so that we had a large enough sample size to run an outcome evaluation. Uh, so uh, Eva and Edwina are going to talk a lot more about the behind the scenes and the co-design and implementation, but now I'd like to actually show you the intervention. So uh, court support officers, and here we have Iris from Dubbo, uh, approach Aboriginal defendants when they're in court to hear the, have their case heard. Uh, and they give them this fold-out tool, pocket-sized fold-out tool, and use it to talk through their goal setting and their planning around their orders. So what they want to achieve, um, what, what their motivation is, uh, what's going to get in the way, and how to get around it. And as you can see from this real example of a plan, the plan doesn't necessarily have to be about the order specifically, but about something that will help the defendant to achieve uh, achieve the goal of complying with the orders. Uh, and another key component of the intervention was that once they had made their plan, the defendants could compose for themselves a short message, a text message, to their future selves to remind them of what they, why they were doing it, what they wanted to do. Uh, and the court support officers text this to them every week. Uh, and here you can see some real examples of the text messages.
And so with that, I will hand over to Eva. And I'm going to rely on a popular internet meme um, to help me describe what I think running behavioural trials is all about. My mum doesn't actually understand at all what I do. I think she just thinks I help people. So starting off with Dr Phil. Society, I think, is still a bit sceptical about what we do, I think. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. My boss thinks that I'm just fixated on getting a positive result, which... To be fair, it's probably not that far from the truth. Frontline staff have this perception that perhaps we're a bit too academic, a bit too theoretical in our approach. Me, well, I like to think I'm doing my bit, my bit to uh, support, you know, world peace, love and happiness. But what I really do and what I'm spending most of the time doing is collaborating with project partners. I'm trying to get their input into decisions and I'm trying to achieve consensus. We like to think it's all about the science, but I like to contend that really it's all about the people. Traditionally, in experimental science, we've regarded the theory as the cornerstone of the intervention. Us as practitioners and researchers, we've done the research, we've read the papers, we, we know what needs to be done and all that's left is just to convince the rest of the people in the room. We might be prepared to make a few adaptations around the edges, that's okay, but really, it's the behavioural science that takes precedence over everything else. But what I've learnt from my projects, and particularly this project and talking to other practitioners in the field, is that the behavioural science is important, but it's no more important than the frontline expertise and the local and cultural context. A lot of implementation science literature is actually consistent with this, in that we know that the quality of implementation is always going to be a lot higher if there's been uh, some local adaptation, as long as those active ingredients remain. In medicine, we've seen in recent times the onset of evidence-based practice, which acknowledges that it's not just the treatment that matters, but the client-patient relationship and the patient characteristics that are actually equally important. You can have a really effective pill, but if no one's taking the pill, then you're not going to achieve anything. And similar with this intervention, we might have what we think is a very robust evidence-based intervention to try and shift behaviour, in this case, domestic violence. But if the client, if the, in this case, the domestic violence defendant isn't engaging with us, then again, we're not going to achieve anything. Co-design is therefore very essential in our context. You start to see co-design not as a compromise, but as something that enriches the process and the outcomes. Now my co-design partner, Edwina, is going to take us through some of the ways that we approach co-design in this project. After seeing the presentations yesterday, I feel like I need to speed date everybody. <laughs> so you're going to fall in love with what's your plan, but more importantly, hopefully we'll share some insights that will really help inspire some action in this space if you're looking at DV or help you understand how we overcome some of the challenges and infused a cultural approach <coughs> with a Western behavioural science approach. So for us, just to set some context, in New South Wales, 80% of Aboriginal people are in custody and spend time in jail because of acts intended to cause injury. The overwhelming majority of those um, offences are domestic and family violence. Aboriginal women make up 34% of the prison population in New South Wales, and unfortunately, they're the fastest growing prison population. Our juveniles are 49% of the juvenile prison population and our men are 28% of the prison population and their top offence for men and women are domestic and family violence incidences and it's the same for juveniles as well so it's a really significant issue that we needed to do something about so for my team hitching our wagon to the behavioural insights work around how we can do something a little bit differently, it's a little bit more focused and sharp and targeted, was really important for us. And it was really important in the co-design because our staff, we're all very different, we work in different settings across New South Wales, but the one thing that anchors us is our desire to help our communities, keep them safe and strong, and to help people that are in the system understand what's going on and hopefully empower them to not come back. So this trial was incredibly important for us to build on that focus that we have to build better paths ways to justice. Um, now the co-design was a really fantastic process. We are very lucky in Australia to have such a great behavioural insights team who really understood that culture plays a significant part in the justice system when you're working with involuntary clients and it'll 
indicate they'll either accept or reject our services. So we need to find a way to infuse some of our approaches like cognitive behaviour therapy and some of the other interventions we run with a cultural responsive um, approach as well. So they came to us with a lot of the tools that they desired, designed and you can see some of those there and we work through with all of our staff who actually do the work on the front line, work in the courts, know the defendants, know the environment and the situations and circumstances of each day and we work through a couple of ways in which we could design an actual tool. So the uh, Z card uh, that Karen pulled out a little bit earlier, this was the early stages of it, first it was too big then it was too small, and then we found one that was just right. And people, uh, particularly our defendants, our clients loved it because you could, it was easy enough to work with. Um, you could, they could write on it, draw on it if they needed to, and it folded up nicely and fit in back pockets or wallets or phone cases. And a lot of people that we know really carried those around, and it really helped anchor them and remind them about, yes, this is what I've got to do and what I can't do, this is why I'm doing it and here's my plan for coming up with the challenges that I know I'm going to face. So it was really important to get that and test that tool and it's also laid the pathway for some other work that we're doing around how we can help people understand all of their justice orders and bail conditions. So it's had lovely benefits for other work that we do. Um, another part that I just touched on, we know culture impacts whether people accept or reject our services, especially in the law and justice space. And when you're working with involuntary clients, how do you hook them in, get them engaged and empower them through the process? So it was really important for us to have tools and something very simple that we do in Australia. You have a bit of artwork and a story behind that artwork. That's your hook to get somebody in. It's very simple. And we had a staff member from Juvenile Justice Design uh, the story about what's your plan, and um, without going into too much detail, there are two worlds, our spiritual world at the top, where our creators, Biami and Rainbow Serpent, reside, and that's the connection between us, building that pathway um, in connection with our ancestors and our way of life. So it's really important to have that story, because sometimes that's the thing that anchors people into the conversation. And one bit of the implementation that I wanted to share with you that was really interesting, of course we were trying to merge this kind of behavioural science way with what we know works with our people and within our culture. One of the challenges we had during the pilot was there was a very specific one to five stage step process to have the conversation. And when we went out during the pilot stage, everyone was really freaking out about, oh God, I've got to do this in the right order. But because they were working in communities where they knew people really well, some of them didn't, they were having conversations that were all over the place, starting at stage five, sometimes stage four. Um, so they were really paranoid about wanting to do it right uh, because we really wanted, didn't want it to interfere with the integrity of the science and mental contrasting. So when we came back and did the debrief, we said to Rory, look, what do we do when we're in this situation? Because we've got people that come and tell us their story. So we've done two and three, but how do we get it back on track? And we found a really good way to have the conversation in that way that doesn't take away from defendants being really empowered in that conversation to design that plan and to come up with their text, but for us to run it in a way that allows us to do the bits we need to do, like explain the orders and, and be really clear, because the orders in particular are the one things that people have a lot of challenge with. And one of the things that have come up, there's a if you get an ADVO, there's often an order that says you cannot have contact with the person in need of protection. And for a lot of our defendants, they thought, no contact, then I can't touch them. Not that I can't call them, talk to them on Facebook, that's all. So we're able to really tease out and get to the core of helping people understand what those orders are. And that is such a big challenge for us in New South Wales because breaches of justice orders, whether you're being supervised by our community corrections, you're on police bail or you're on court bail, huge challenges with getting people to comply. So this has really helped leverage a whole heap of other work that we need to make some improvements on because more often than not, when someone breaches, especially when they breach their ADVO, they're back in custody, they're on remand, they're waiting for their court date and they're not necessarily getting support to rehabilitate or change behaviours. So it's a real, real challenge and we're hoping that this um, plays a really big part in changing some of that narrative. Um, one of the other challenges that we had as well is we've got different courthouses that uh, make it really tough for people to have conversations and in our big metro courts it was kind of like trying to make a plan in the, in the networking dinner last night, and shoulder to shoulder, cheek to cheek and it's not exactly the best space to kind of have a conversation with someone about their behaviours and what they can do to change them and how they, make, how they plan for it. So some of the things we did, we had to be very adaptive with our environment and the postcard was one example that we used. So when someone rocks up to court, we'll say, oh, hey, Eva, 
kind of noticed that you're here for an ADVO. Um, my name's Edwina. I'm, I'm here to support you through the process. And can I tell you about a, a project that we've got? So we've given people a copy of the postcard so they can have a read of it. And then we're saying, if you're interested, come back and see us after you come out of court. And that was a really useful tool. It was something that we hadn't had at the start, but helped really increase our take up because we were having a few challenges in some locations. So having tools and getting the messages out about what we do was really important. Kept it plain English, used the art word, and tried to use some really empowering language so people could see this. Yes, you've got an ADVO, but there is, there is some hope on the other side of that. And this plan could help you, um, help you get through. So we were very lucky to get some investment. The Premier in New South Wales had a priority around DV, so there was a lot of money. Where the priorities go, the attention goes and the money goes. It was probably about maybe £350,000, not a lot, but we were able to do a lot with that, uh, that investment that we've got, and we've had it for the last three years. So one of the things I would not do this trial without, and we would not have succeeded and gotten this far without, is the employment of a quality assurance coordinator. We had never done a randomised trial before in my team, so obviously, as you know, there's information that needs to be collected and stored, it needs to be accurate and cleansed, and the quality assurance coordinators played a huge role in making sure that the outcomes evaluation, which will be done by the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research in New South Wales, will be ready to go in January next year. Jeremy also has the very important role of being a mentor and support for all of our frontline staff. There's 49 of my staff out on the ground across New South Wales making plans with people. So there's a lot of support that he provides to them to make sure that they're, they're clear about the conversation they need to have and they understand the science behind it, that they've got the confidence to do it as well because that was another challenge that we had. And sometimes we've had to retrain people a couple of times because it is a shift in the way that we used to do our conversations. So it was really important to have that quality assurance coordinator there leading all of that work. And that's Jeremy's only job, so he gets to devote all of his time and attention to it. And he works very closely with Eva and the BIU team to make sure that if there's any supports we need from those guys, we leverage that and get it out to our staff straight away, so it's really important. And we also employed uh, an additional five staff across the state, and those workers are court support workers, but specifically for Watch Your Plan. So their job is to really go out and look for all of those defendants on our um, ADVO list days to try to get people people agreeing to um, make a plan and supporting all of the staff in their regions to make the plans, do the reporting correctly and support, support the staff in their region. So it's really, really important work. And then we also had some administrative tools that we had to develop. So New South Wales has a lot of different courts all over the state. Some sit once a month, some sit once a fortnight, some sit every day. So we had this crazy calendar because it wasn't in sync. Um, so Jeremy did the very hard task along with Eva of setting up this calendar because our outcome evaluation, obviously we need a control and treatment group. So what your plan was offered on an on week and an off week, but it wasn't necessarily the same on and off week across the state. So we had to really pay attention to detail and, and set up tools so staff are really clear about when they can make plans with people and when they can't and what they need to report. We were also in the habit of recording information on a database about the things that we do with our clients. So we developed a very specific What's Your Plan database to include all of the information that Boxar would need for the outcome evaluation. And we went through a few iterations of that, but finally got it into a great space and linked it in with the SMS system so you could put the data in about the client and also link the SMS to Orgo at the same time, which is a really big investment. However, it has made life staff out on the ground a lot easier in implementation and that was one of the challenges that we needed to come up with our staff really enjoy and get their energy from engaging with people and supporting them through that court process but we also needed them to do this back-end work in terms of the data and data entry and making sure it's correct so it's a it's a big step in that RCT trial and a little bit of a culture shift that we had to make um, but it's added so much benefit to the work that we're doing in that space as well really 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 critical. And then one of the other things that we wanted to share with you, and even though this is coming from an Aboriginal cultural perspective, I think these are themes that can pretty much relate to all uh, people that you're working with or different cultural groups. One of the things that's really important for us, we're, we're very 
kind of connected. We love to connect with people, not talk about business straight away. So one of the lessons for us, and I think BIU have taken away, is we like to have a good yarn before we get into the business of what we're trying to do. So taking that time to connect and know people is really important, and especially for Aboriginal people. We're a little bit sceptical and suspicious, especially of other government partners, and that that stems from our history and it's something that still permeates today. So being able to really actively listen and be engaged with, with our staff is really important, but I think that's a really big important part of all of the work that we do, especially with Frontline when you're sitting in, a, in what we call an ivory tower over here and you're trying to direct work on the ground with people dealing with other human beings standing in front of them. It's really important for them to make feel like you're connected to that work um, and that you're really actively listening. And another really big important part was building that trust and I think that was one of the things that our staff really loved about working with BIU during the co-design process because they could literally see their advice and their feedback come to life in the tools, in the way that we were working, in the science approaches, so if they felt really empowered. This wasn't just a, a trial that they were running, this was something that they were personally invested in that they helped design. So that was that real intent to go out there and motivation for them to really try their best and make it work, so that was really important for us. And one of the things that's been really important for us to understand and our Department of Justice or now Department of Communities and Justice because we've merged with Family and Community Services and Justice now was to really, we, we're more relational rather than hierarchical and sometimes some parts of Justice and, and Family and Community Services don't quite get that but what that's allowed us to do in this process is really develop our leadership um, people have, especially our whip axos, have really taken on this strong role of I'm the, uh, I guess, the practice manager of what's your plan in my region and I'm here to support everyone. And it's really helped build up their confidence um, and their skill base and their capacity and their, and their aspirations in many ways. So it's been really important for us and it's been a lesson and a bit of finding and insight that we've been able to share with our executive about how we develop and mentor Aboriginal leaders within our organisation. So it's been really important. And then, of course, storytelling. We're, we're the best storytellers ever, aren't we, Eva? Um, we've always got a yarn about something. Um, we often have a lot of sidebars, but it was really important for us to provide staff with an opportunity to, I guess, have that debrief in space to talk about their experiences of doing the plan because we've got a lot of staff that are very introverted. They're really good at the data entry and paperwork, but the actual one-to-one -one engagement is sometimes very draining for them and it takes a lot for them. So being able to identify who we needed to provide more support was for was really good and giving them that forum to, to talk about the plan because we had some of our best workers a bit sceptical of this approach. They didn't think it would work, but then they started to make the plans and they become Watch Your Plan's biggest advocates because they've seen the changes that they've made with, the, with their clients in the community. And even though the evaluation doesn't start until next year probably at this stage, uh, we do know the feedback from our staff is there are some people that they saw pretty much on a monthly basis that they haven't been seeing for a while, that haven't re-offended, and the outcome evaluation is looking at does making a plan extend the time between the breach or does it stop reoffending altogether? So we're really excited. And when we started the trial, our breach rate for Aboriginal people was 28.9%. And that was in 2015-16. And now in 2017-18, it's about 21%. We're very hopeful that What's Your Plan has played a big made a big contribution to that reduction. Um, and I guess we'll see in, in 12 months' time when the interim report comes out. But we're very proud of the piece of work that we've done. It is a world first, so it's been something that's been very exciting for us and we really hope that the lessons that we've learnt and the outcomes and results that we get really inspire some action across the globe around how to deal with this very challenging problem of, of domestic violence and, more importantly, providing something for the perpetrator, which is often a big gap that we find across. So I'll hand back over to Eva now. Uh, just some very quick takeaways from me as well. Um, so uh, I think the first for me is about knowing your minimal BI requirements before you even start talking to project partners. Uh, I think that, um, well, one thing, sometimes you can sort of tell that from the academic study that you're reading. We all, you know, are familiar with the idea of knowing the key components, but often what I've found is actually you really need to speak to the academics, the source of the study or the... Or the, or the theory that you're using to really understand what it is that you can uh, needs to stay and what are the things that you can adapt. Uh, in my case, um, I was fortunate I was having, having a holiday in New York and I caught up with Gabriel Ottigen, who's, who wrote the, uh, who's the creator of Mental Contrasting and uh, co-creator of Whoop. 
and, uh, and really was able to, to get a sense from her about what are the things that, uh, the, the, that we, can, uh, we, we can adapt and what, what we can't. The second one is leveraging adaptive uh, implementation. Uh, I think in the context of the work, uh, we really need to be prepared to evaluate and adapt as we go. Um, in field trials, field trials, there are just so many operational and envir environmental nuances that uh, you really, you know, you can't anticipate in advance. So I guess the first lesson from that is don't try to get it perfect. You just get out there and just start it, get started, and then you'll work out what some of the um, some of the issues are. Um, in our case, I think both Karen and, and Edwina touched on that we we did a pilot, start off within a few courts, uh, then we tried to sort of scale to all 46 courts after that, and. Uh, it was very difficult. So what uh, we found that there was a lot of things we didn't anticipate around even just data recording and a lot of the complexities around you know who's eligible, what, what's an on week, what's an off week. Uh, and so we actually ended up sort of pausing there, allowing for a two month betting down period and then we, uh, we, we picked up the, the formal evaluation from there. Some people might argue that's a fidelity issue that, you know, if you're kind of making adjustments as you go along, but I think as long as you're recording them, uh, you've got, you know, an, under, an understanding about why you're making changes, why you're uh, making enhancements as you go, and uh, then you can factor that into your um, analysis. And the final one really picks up on a lot of what Edwina's talked about, about promoting shared ownership. And I think that's about not just co-designing the intervention, but actually during the implementation as well. We've had Whilst our, um, our frontline staff are very dispersed across 46 courts over a very, very big uh, state, we, uh, we, we've been able to get them together at least a couple of times a year, um, more than that actually, where we've we, and, and, and given them an update and said, how do you think it's going? What do you think we can improve? What are your, you know, what, what do you think we can do? And, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, yeah, get their input into decisions and making sure that uh, everyone feels empowered. Okay, I think that's the end of our one. I love So thank you so much for the Australian team. Uh, I'll have some summary comments at the end of both projects, but we're going to just go through some of the questions on Slido specifically first. Um, so one of the questions that we have here is, um, were there any challenges around literacy in the vulnerable groups? And if so, how was this um, overcome? Were there any other obstacles anticipated that you were able to manage? Ooh. Can you read that one again? It's a vulnerable, was it? Yeah, so it's challenges around literacy. Yeah, I guess like a little bit to that, and then oh, if you yeah. want to put. Uh, so what we actually did was uh, when we were, um, we actually had that feedback from staff that there are a li li that there are literacy issues. We actually uh, allowed for um, defendants to draw pictures if if they couldn't. Um, so in some cases we we had we had that. So we had sort of like a visual kind of representation. Also, um, the court uh, the court support officer was able to. Uh, write the plan, although we really encouraged them to get the defendant to write the plan uh, where they couldn't and, you know, it was just done um, orally. Uh, and, uh, but we did, we did have a, a couple of plans that do actually have a visual component as well. Yeah. Did you want to add Yeah, to and we did have, down in one of our regional courts, we had a hearing impaired uh, gentleman who was coming in for an ADVO. What we did and what they often do, and this is about this holistic approach that we often have with our Aboriginal defendants, is they brought his um, partner in to be part of the conversation, to help communicate, because he didn't know sign language. Um, so we found, a, the officer found a way to work with her so we could make sure that he was identifying the motivation to comply. He was really clear about what he was going to have the most challenge with and she was able to write up the plan for him. So we adapt um, in whatever way we need to. And the, the graphic um, drawings on, on some plans has, has been the thing that's um, worked the most. So, um, yeah, I think we, we kind of... If there's a challenge there, we'll find our staff on the ground will find a way, a creative way. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, looking at the questions, I will be talking a little bit more about mental contrasting because that's also something that was part of our intervention. Sorry, I didn't explain it well. <laughs> the next question is, apart from what's your plan, did you think of other possible interventions, uh, such as incentivizing uptake or sticking to the intervention? What were other things that you had maybe considered before? Do you want to talk to that? Sure. Well, so... Um... I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> there were so what ended up happening was looking at the the court process, the process that the defendant goes through um, from receiving their ADVO all the way through 
to the point of reoffending, uh, mapping out that that um, process, particularly interacting with the court, the team looked at different opportunities to intervene. So uh, there is, I think one of my favorite ones is the um, reminder text message, which sounds so obvious, but one of the big issues was that 20% um, of defendants weren't turning up to court. Uh, and turning up to court was a, bet, was a good predictor of sticking with their apprehended domestic violence order. Um, so uh, the, the team ran a, a randomised control trial um, where half defendants who were due to go to court the next day got a reminder text message and half the defendants didn't. And more people turned up to court. Surprise, surprise. Um, and if you want to read more about that, that's in the Behavioural Insights Unit 2018 report. Um, there's also, uh, there was also the app as well. Did you want to talk about the... Aval? Yeah, so uh, what we've done while this project is underway is uh, develop a, a digital app for defendants. And this came out of um, some of the, that early field work we did in 2014. Uh, and what that app, uh, and, and where police had sort of said it, they wanted something that they can actually leave for, for defendants. Uh, we also were a little bit opportunistic in that we had a part of government that was kind of uh, really interested in innovation and was offering, you know, grant money to tech companies to come up with solutions to... Um, policy problems, so uh, we, domestic violence became a priority for that and, and we were able to leverage that for, for us. So we ended up with, uh, uh, with, with, a, with an app which has got, um, uh, which, which has a digitised version of some of the interventions that we've already tested, including uh, the, the, the one that Karen was just talking about. So we've got court reminders that are, that are um, embedded in the app. Uh, we've also got uh, the Plain English ADVO, which is one of the first prod um, projects that we did after that field work in 2014 where we simplified the court orders into plain English uh, and, and it's customisable as well in the app. Uh, then we also uh, have a digitised ver version of this What's Your Plan conversation, a number of other little therapeutic tools like a mood tracker uh, and we've, we've, at this stage we've just, uh, we're not talking about that today because uh, <laughs> we're still, um, we, haven't, we haven't commenced the trial for that yet. We've done an implementation trial just to assess take-up and we think that we can get enough people downloading this to be able to make a trial vi viable. Uh, but we have done some user testing with, uh, with defendants, uh, well, not say defendants, um, men's behaviour change group participants to get a sense of what they think of it and the perception's actually been quite positive. Uh, so, yeah, there are other things that we're exploring and we're sort of continuing to build on the interventions as, as we go. Great. So I'm going to stop questions for the project for now and then we're going to go to the next part and then we'll take more questions at the end, okay? Okay, so I'm up next. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, there's actually quite uh, several interesting connections between the project that we did with the Ministry of Social and Family Development in Singapore and also the work in Australia. So um, in this project, what we did was that we worked with um, youth probationers. So these are mostly teenagers who, for one reason or another, are under a court order um, and they therefore they have to comply with a series of different regulations. Um, some of it is going to programs, attending programs. They have to um, meet with their probation officers regularly. One of the things that they also have to do is to be home on time by a curfew. And this is a court-mandated curfew, not a parent-mandated uh, one, um, as you all may have. Um, so depending on their risk level, as well as their age, their time restriction or curfew could be anywhere from 7 o'clock till midnight. Um, and so our challenge was how do we ensure that as many of these youth probationers are home on time? And that was basically our project. One of the questions that we got earlier was um, for the New South Wales project, well, were there other criteria of compliance that people were looked at, looking at? Um, Elvin will talk a little bit about um, why we ended up with um, time restriction and curfew compliance, even though there were other criteria for their um, probation order. So in our project, we had the, the, our single overall objective was to encourage youth probationers to be home before their time restriction. And we were able to actually fortunately run two trials. So our first trial, um, similar to um, Make a Plan, uh, to What's Your Plan, is a WHOOP-style um, commitment plan. So as Karen had talked about earlier, WHOOP is inspired by mental contrasting and implementation intentions. Mental contrasting basically is how do you first take something that's positive, so the thing that you want, your goal, right? And how do you contrast that with the thing that is standing in your way, the challenge, and how do you overcome that? 
right? So it isn't just about thinking of the good thing that you want, but also trying to figure out what is the obstacle that is standing in your way. And the theory is that when you are able to contrast the thing that you want with the challenge, and then you add on that implementation intention, which is the planning, you are then able to more productively overcome this obstacle to get to this goal that you want. So it isn't just a pie in the sky, I wish I had this, but it's actually a more realistic and constructive understanding of things that stand in your way and how do you then get over it. So that was the um, first trial that we ran in 2018. And then we ran a second trial earlier this year, which is a self-designed SMS reminder. So this is a simple SMS reminder to probationers to be home on time, but the reminders were designed by themselves. So they were the ones who actually crafted these messages to themselves. So I'm going to go through the, each of them. Um, the way that we have structured this is that I will present to you our findings, the way that you would see any typical sort of like um, research presentation. Elvin will then sort of like draw the curtain and describe to you sort of like the challenges and the trade-offs that we might actually have had to make in order for this trial to run the way that it was. Okay, so this is what the um, WHOOP plan looked like. So basically, we asked probationers to come up with their wish. So what is this positive thing that they would like if they were able to comply with their uh, time restriction? We asked them to identify the outcome that they would be able to experience as a result of um, complying to their time restriction. What was the obstacle? So this is the mental contrasting part. What is this obstacle that is standing in your way? Is it your friends who are asking you to stay out late? Is it that there is something at home that is preventing you from being home? Um, is it just the fact that your home environment is very negative? Um, and then finally, the plan. What is your plan for getting over this obstacle? Do you then tell your friend, are there certain things that you say to your friend to stand your ground, for instance? Um, is there someone that you could uh, lean, lean on to sort of solve the problem at home such as it's a more productive environment? Um, so the key to remember about this trial, it is that it was implemented with their probation officer during their regular weekly meetings. So basically the extent to which um, probationers experience this conversation could be varied depending on the probation officer that they had. We had an initial sample size of 460 probationers um, and the Behavior Insights team did several observations to make sure that there was fidelity to the plan. Results. Inconclusive. <laughs> um, we, for, I know, sorry for the build up. Um, we, <laughs> we, I know, it was so great. Uh, we found no significant differences between the treatment and the control group. So between the group that received the WHOOP um, plan and those who did not, um, we actually it was the breach rate was about 60%, give or take, roughly. So our hypothesis, um, and we haven't actually been able to go back to corroborate this, but our hypothesis is that because the probation officer was key in implementing this conversation, and there might be a huge variability in the relationship that probationers have with their probation officer. Some of that might have very nurturing, very, um, you know, sort of like reassuring relationships. Others might have a slightly more strict or like uh, punitive relationship. And if leveraging on that and there's such variability, that might therefore also then be variability in the way that the plan was implemented. Um, also, the way that um, compliance with the time restriction is collected is by random checks. So it's not possible to call all 464 probationers every day. And so there are random checks, um, either by phone or in, um, at the door. So just come up and then see if you're home. Um, the thing with that is that probation officers um, sometimes are able to explain why a probationer might not be home. So for instance, they might have a part-time job that allows them to be home past their time restriction. Um, they could be in national service, which is mandatory in Singapore. Um, and so again, there was the, the role of the probation officer in explaining why a probationer might not be home was also something that we had to take into account. So like I said, fortunately, we were given a second chance to run a trial again earlier this year. Um, and that's where we decided to think about ways in which we can still engage the probation officer because they do have a very integral role in the, in the probation journey, but maybe foreground the role of the probationer, um, him or herself, right? And so that's where we came up with the idea of self-designed SMS uh, messages. So similar to what, um, what's your plan is, we also had a reminder component. Um, and the theory or the hypothesis behind getting the probationers to design their own reminders is the idea of cognitive internal consistency. Right? And so if probationers were able to come up with their own reminders, they would be then more compelled to have to sort of like abide by them and live up to these messages. Otherwise, there's this huge sort of like um, psychic discomfort, you know, there's cognitive dissonance and the only way to sort of like readjust that discomfort is to then abide by this message that you have written to yourself. So this is um, the 
the message that they would receive. There's an instruction to sort of like prompt a short conversation between the probation officer and the probationer. So keeping to your time restriction is important, but why is it important to you? Right, so to get the, the probationer to actually reflect and think a little bit about why fulfilling this um, probation journey is so important. And then, again, write an SMS to yourself. Start with, I want to be back on time because... And then, um, just to give you an example, these are extracts of um, actual reminders that probationers had sent to themselves. So they range in all sorts of um, ways. So some of them are very, very long, as you can see. Some of them are quite short. Um, some of them are also quite nonsensical. We, we got like um, apple pie dot 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 or because or you know and so it was on the on the one hand it was uh, very very heartening and encouraging to read some of the messages that they they um, designed for themselves and then on, and other times it was also actually very very funny um, but the key thing is that they designed it on their own so if dot 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 apple pie is the thing that is going to trigger you to be home on time then let that be it right because that's the thing that you had designed. Um, maybe a, that joke makes you sort of think about like, oh, what was I doing at that point? And that's, that's a very sort of like visceral reminder to be home. These are our findings. Um, as you can see, a larger proportion of the treatment group uh, actually are now compliant to their time restriction. You do not see stars. Um, I'm, I'm going to point that out to you. Um, before we ran the trial, we had done some power calculations um, and we knew that we were not going to probably be powered enough to see a significant difference. So all of this was actually pre-specified, right? And so um, all we were expecting was to have a directional result and this is probably the best result that we could expect given the small sample size. It turned out that um, in our first trial, we had 464 probationers. In our second trial, we had 273, which for the probation service is a good thing, which means fewer probationers are in custody. Um, and so, but it also meant that our sample size was... Um, significantly compromised and so given that even much smaller sample size that we were able to see um, this result is something that was actually very encouraging. Um, I'll be going to talk a little bit more about what this might mean in terms of scaling up but the, the crux of his, his presentation actually is what we had to sort of like do to get to this point also some of the considerations that we might have to trade off um, when looking at time restriction as an outcome measure for you know compliance to probation in general. So Alvin? Hi, uh, thank you for joining this session again. Okay, um, I'm just going to dive straight in. Uh, I had a chance to communicate with some of you yesterday, and uh, some of you expressed surprise that there's actually crime in Singapore. Uh, there's, there's, there's really crime in Singapore. So uh, there were questions asking what kind of crime, is it just petty theft, uh, is it spitting on the floor? Uh, no, uh, these are... So Sorry, uh, yeah, this one. So. The offences are generally theft-related. Uh, they, are, they are VCH, voluntary causing hurt. Uh, there are plenty of those cases, actually, because we are also dealing with young offenders. Uh, and as of most developed nations or any other nations, we actually have a fair bit of drugs. Uh, we are not looking at, of course, uh, the, the, the extreme end of drug-taking, but we do have our fair share. So um, with this yeah, as, a, as a context, I hope you understand that actually we do have our fair bit of offenders whom we have to manage. And uh, the difficulty also comes in the sense that because most of these offenders are young, uh, maybe I'll just give you a bit more context from where I, a probation services, we work with the courts, or we also work with pre-court diversionary programs. So if the offences are deemed not to be too serious, we try to divert them away so that they don't have that risk of being incarcerated later on. But however, if we have offences that are repeated theft, theft, uh, theft behaviour, uh, sexual offences, for example, we... we they are prosecuted in court, but we try to see how we can work with them in the community first. <laughs> because given that they are young, uh, if they don't work out in the community, the next step is actually institutionalization, which is, I think, literature has already suggested that we should try to avoid that whenever possible. So just to add on on what Serene has also touched on, uh, there, were, there are some examples of conditions that we, we typically have. Sorry that we typically have on probation. So there's time restriction, there's community service, there is regular reporting to probation officer. Uh, so for certain offences like drugs, for certain offences like sexual offending, we have specified uh, intervention programmes that they must go, go for. So given all these conditions, uh, then we will just, during that order, we'll see whether if they're able to complete it, and if they're able to complete it, then there will be no record or conviction of any sort. 
So um, the reason why we chose time restriction as, as part of our study is really because uh, at that time, it, proved, it, it is probably the most tangible thing that we could measure uh, in, in an outcome setting. Because how do you actually measure how well the program worked? Uh, short of tracing them or tracking them for the next three years to see whether there's any recidivism, uh, we can't really do that on a short-term scale. So, and that also seems to be the most direct approach where we could nudge and influence their behavior to see if they could comply with that particular condition. So this, these are some of the lessons that we have learned. Uh, as Serene has mentioned, these are really, uh, th this is an experience that we, we never had before. So, and I, and I know that given the, the running of RCT, we usually have a lot of more failures, I think. I would like to think so, than success. So, and some of these failures and these challenges are usually not shared with everybody else. We usually share the success stories, right? So, uh, let me just take you through them. Okay, so in the first trial, uh, probationers were actually not given any chance to partake in that crafting or solution. So, we had that assumption that one size will fit all. Uh, we didn't involve them in whatsoever, uh, in any means uh, that we should. And the problem with that is that we run into the difficulty of ensuring that everyone understood the intervention method as well. So we, we decided to use the WOOD method, and then we had our probation officer deliver it. Okay, but we never once asked the probation, probationers, okay, how should they, what should they do to better abide by these conditions? We wanted to depend on the messenger effect, okay, and I think Serene pointed this out as well. Uh, the relationship between a probation officer and a probationer is, non is involuntary. Right? It's a, we are trying to target a mandatory behavior. So half the time we, let, let's put it this way, the probationers don't like us. Right? That's, that's a given, right? Because now they have a two-year order, they have to see us every day. Uh, and if our style or our approach in terms of communicating with them is a bit more strict or is a bit more top-down, they may not like it. So therein, we had run to the, to the, to the difficulty of, building, of tapping on rapport to see how the messenger effect, messenger effect could be amplified. So in the second trial, uh, we decided that we do not need the probation officers anymore because from the first trial, the first, uh, I would say this as well, we incurred the wrath of many of my staff because now they had to do the delivery of the nudge. And then we had to monitor and supervise and, and put them through short courses to see how they can best deliver the nudge. Right, so it became uh, administratively difficult for them as well because what if they were, this particular probationer is going through a difficult period. So right after you uh, issue an official sanction, you're going to work with them on how to comply by their time restriction. And you're going to try and con uh, persuade them that, look, this is good for you, okay, you should follow. So I don't think they are able to see that. So for the second trial, we decided to take the probation officers out altogether. So what we did was, we actually used uh, the SMS reminders, right? So we had direct access to the probation, uh, probationers in a way that if they crafted the messages, we are able to push it back to them. The probation officers are taken out of the equation altogether, okay? So the next point is the uh, outcome measure for RCTs. We understand that um, it is the gold standard for running any sort of trials uh, to have any sort of results, but we are also struggling with this thing about uh, whether compliance with time restriction is actually an effective proxy. Right? It's a good proxy for effective rehabilitation because we know that rehab has many components. Uh, there are many aspects that are actually more qualitative than quantitative in nature. So that's really our struggle. Uh, we can't tell you, we can't tell that because you comply by time restriction, therefore you're going to have a successful rehabilitation. We can't. Right? We, we can at best postulate that, look, uh, he has no dif this, this particular provisional has the capacity to comply and see how we, and then we see what we can do from there. So uh, we are also trying to balance results against the larger context of successful re rehabilitation. We, it's important that we do not see the results in isolation. So we try to see, and this is probably where we're going to uh, hopefully elicit some response from you in a sense. Have you guys also experienced this kind of difficulty? Because uh, we are dealing with a lot more complex human behavior now. Uh, some of it seems commonsensical, but some of it doesn't make sense to us at all. So uh, the type of crime, the type of motivation that goes into an offender's head, sometimes we, we can't really rationalize. So we also hope that you know, we could have an exchange of ideas. And of course, there's this part about the acute present bias. 
the first trial, we assume that a one-off worksheet or intervention is enough. Okay, so after that, their motivation to be on good behavior is self-sustaining, but of course we were wrong. Um, the second trial, we adopted SMS reminders, and what we did was that we, SMS reminders were sent to them twice a week. So in a sense, we hope to break up that future, uh, their sense of the future into smaller chunks, into smaller, more manageable chunks, so that they can see that, okay, we are still trying to work towards uh, the end goal. So um, maybe just to share with you a little bit, sometimes when the SMS, some of the provisioners have actually told us that when they got the reminders, they were very happy about it. This is the more qualitative uh, on the site, we are collecting some qualitative data. And we also had, I think Serene has seen this before, we had provisioners who reply to the automated service. So at the back end, we are able to see. So uh, there are replying messages like, thank you so much for reminding me tonight. I will go home now. And then 30 minutes later, you get another message that says, I'm home already. So we were thinking that, look, if we could tap on that particular... Uh, so this is something interesting, right? If we could do this long term and we could scale it up, we could actually see that if there's that interaction between the system and us, of course, somebody at the back end has to do all this, uh, it could actually be useful in, in making sure that the nudge is consistent and the provisioners are, uh, you know, trying to, uh, are able to comply. So we see... Sorry. My, yeah, that's it. So we see value in this. Uh, what we're going to do now, uh, the next stage, is really to see if we could evaluate the qualitative nature of the messages that they crafted for themselves. Because I think uh, you have heard over these, I think it was mentioned yesterday during one of the talks, that the, the quality, the, how much effort goes into that particular message makes a lot of difference. Okay, so I think initially we, I was telling Serene, do expect swear words in, in the messaging, in the self-crafting messages. Because, but we, we didn't want to intervene because if it, you, if it helps you, if you swear at yourself and you go home on time, that's fine with us. So right now, we're going to see whether certain keywords actually make sense. Are they more likely to result in compliance? And then we will see how, where else we can take that uh, later on. Right, thank you. Given that there are a lot of questions, I'm just going to keep my comments very short. I think um, one of the things that Elvin and actually also Edwina and Eva and Karen have brought up is the fact that as a field, I think behavioral science is maturing. Um, and because of that also, the kinds of interventions that we are, the kinds of behaviors that we have to address are becoming more complex. The environments into which we have to go into are also um, different from, you know, 10, even five years ago, where we're looking at things like tax compliance, for instance. Um, so as a result, as a field, how do we then think about things like, oh, which outcome measure is a good one? One of the questions that we came here is, well, how do we decide on you know, time restriction or breach as a good outcome to look at, as opposed to other conditions of either an ADVO uh, compliance or a probation order? Um, these are non-voluntary behaviours, right? And so as a result, it is very tricky as practitioners to decide on what is a good outcome that we can evaluate. Um, as you all know, as part of the Behavior Insights team's project, I mean, like our, um, our methodology, being able to evaluate something is very important. It's very difficult to manage something if you can't measure it first. And so some of the trade-offs that we have had to make has been quite um, mm -hmm. challenging. And, and this is something that I hope you also share with us, like in your questions, if you've also encountered um, challenges like this on your own, where you've had to make difficult decisions on what you actually really care about, but the things that you can actually measure um, and some of the ways in which you might have gotten around that. Um, okay, so on that note, I'm going to go through some of the questions. Please keep adding questions. Where I, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to answer all of them. We will try to hang around after this or maybe catch you at lunch. Um, one of the questions that was asked actually is about the ethics of running an underpowered trial. Um, and that is something that, I, personally, I don't know about Karen or <laughs> about you guys, I face a lot because um, I do a lot of work in home affairs and in compliance um, and with vulnerable populations. And our ability to get very, very large sample sizes often can be quite difficult. Um, and so in those instances, we often treat it as a pilot. So what we just want to make sure is that we are not actively doing harm. So we're not seeing that people are being hurt um, by sending themselves you know, a text message that has several swear words in it. Um, but like as Alvin said, we also often try to complement underpowered trials with as rich a qualitative um, component as possible. Right? And so if we're not able to be um, as rigorous or at least as, um, 
uh, reliable in our quantitative findings? What can the qualitative findings tell us about the process? What do the text messages have to look like? What are some keywords that they use? What is the process um, that probation officers and probationers undergo such that we can take that and then replicate um, in, uh, if, if we are intending on scaling up? The other thing also is that this is just one of several conditions that we mentioned. Um, and if there, are there other ways in which we can look at the, the different other conditions that are being um, as part of the, the probation order? So for example, attendance rates, right? So I would not say that an underpowered trial is the only way. Like in this case, it's just one of several other measures that we're looking at. Um, I don't know if Karen has anything to add about running underpowered trials. <laughs> I rarely set out to run an underpowered trial, <laughs> but so particularly when you're recruiting into a, an intervention, and this is very fresh in my mind because we just launched an intervention where we had a target number and we were watching it tick up over time, over the recruitment period. Um, and I think to Serene's point, you can't always guarantee you are going to have enough power, um, uh, particularly when it's opt-in. So you do need to develop a lot of other qualitative uh, measures so that you can iterate and, and change and pilot it. So if you think about our, our pilot with the, the seven uh, court support officers, not powered, but they had very strong opinions about what worked and what didn't, and they were working on the front line. They knew way better than we did what the reception was and, and how it would be. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I didn't mention is our evaluation for what she planned also included a process evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, which was done by Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research, which mm -hmm. actually assessed ha how well BIU and ASU set up the program. Mm -hmm. And it goes into a lot of detail about the particular challenges we had, how we overcame them, things we put in place. So if you want to go and find a little bit more in depth about some some of our solutions and some of the things that we did to bring the trial to life and then resuscitate it again when we hit challenges. That uh, report, if you just type in what's your plan process evaluation, it should pop up um, on your Google browser or if you go to Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research, it will be listed on there as well. We didn't go into too much of that today, but it is a great, um, yeah. great resource for us because often um, in justice we don't do a lot of evaluation around how programs are set up and we know that's so critical in, in making sure something's successful that we set it out in the right way. And I'd never heard three more sweeter words implemented as intended. It was, <laughs> it was relief and, and it's very, very sweet. So, um, yeah. It's, there's lots of lessons and learnings in there. We'd like to take some more. And we actually have some brochures. I thought 100 would be way too many. Uh, turns nope. out it wasn't enough. <laughs> um, so I don't want to start a rumble about what's your plan brochures because you're all in love now. But they're up the front here if you want to um, grab a copy and read a little bit more about the trial and our project. Mm -hmm. Um, another question that we received, I think it's at the bottom right now, but I think it's one that a lot of people ask um, about is to how do you get buy-in? So um, I, I can't really see it from here, but how, challenge how challenging is it to get the organisation that you're working with to agree to run a trial, I guess, in a nutshell? Um, and this often is a, a very tricky thing. It's like, do you start with the operation staff? Do you start with the bosses? Do you start with the directors? Um, where, how, what is your plan of action, right? It's like trying to fight Sparta or something. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Karen, Karen and um, Edwina start first, maybe, or I, I could start a little bit on our side. But um, in the case of the probation officers, it was, more, it was quite two-pronged. So we were lucky to have the probation, at least for Elvin and his team, the Behavioral Insights team within the um, probation service, sort of like do their engagement with the probation officers, right? Where uh, on the Behavioral Insights team on our end, we did a lot of like presentations to the bosses. Right, and to try to get them to understand that this has been effective in other areas, other areas related to compliance, um, and really try to persuade um, the bosses on giving the, giving the go-ahead to do some of these things um, on the ground. Because so it basically has to come both from the top as well as from the bottom, because um, often you might have your staff be very persuaded and really very eager and very enthusiastic, but if the bosses are very risk-averse, for instance, um, and very sort of like, oh, I don't know about this, um, that is actually often very, very difficult. But vice versa, you could have a boss that is very ambitious, right, who has great ideas, but yet the staff are reluctant because they are the ones who are going to have to ultimately do the job. So, you know, there's no point in your bosses having these grand ideas and being very, very open and progressive. Um, but if the staff themselves are then risk averse, how do you then um, 
address that problem. And so we sort of like needed to have a two-pronged attack where we like tried to persuade the bosses on like how this is going to make the probation service sort of like stand out as like experimental. Um, and you know, Elvin's director was really such such an enthusiast and such an advocate. She was like, "We are in it, and it doesn't matter if we fail, but at least we we tried, right?" And I think she came from the the point of view is that. If we don't try, that's actually unethical. Because how do we know this thing that we're doing right now is working? So try, right? And if it doesn't work, then at least we know we're not going to do it again, <laughs> right? But at least we have made a point, and because we, we're working with such vulnerable populations, we really to make, really, really need to make an effort to make sure that the thing that we are doing is going to be effective. Because not trying um, might actually do more harm to this group that really needs help. Um, so if Alvin could say um, a little bit more. I think I, sorry, I think I mentioned just now that uh, I incurred the wrath of some of my colleagues. We want to do this trial. So many of them were a bit uh, skeptical about how whether this is going to work and how, how much is it going to work and how much difference is it going to make. Um, I think more importantly is really how we pitch it. If we are really interested, so how are we going to pitch it to our colleagues as well? So uh, my TMI, what we really did was we told the probation officers, the rest of the probation officers, is that look, we are nudging them every day anyway. You're babysitting them, you're trying to change your behavior in a certain direction. So why not introduce more science into it? Why not have something that's a bit more uh, targeted and uh, it can stand the, the, the rigor of evaluation? And then after that, we are able to replicate and scale it up to see which other areas we could influence as well. So that, that was a big struggle, actually. I mean, to convince the staff, you know, this is the way that we, we want to go forward. So. In, in New South Wales, the justice system has been going through significant reform for the last three years, and it was off the back of just the pure numbers. We've got an incredibly high reoffending rate in New South Wales for a number of offences. It's quite expensive to lock people up, and it drove the Premier to make a priority around reoffending, and that mm. resulted in significant investment, and it really challenged our community corrections and corrective services to think differently about how they deal with offenders, that they keep in custody, and also that they manage in the community. And there's been a really significant cultural shift off the back of that data telling that compelling story that mm. what you're doing now and what we've been doing for the last 20 years, it's just not working. You have to do something different. And they've really changed their tune about how they manage compliance. So now it's more focused on behaviour changes. We have a lot of particularly disadvantaged groups that just, you know, might not be able to get to the appointment on time or don't have the money to travel on the bus or the train to mm. get to community corrections. But behaviourally and in terms of other risks, they're reducing. So there's a real focus on behaviour attitude and change now rather than straight compliance and that was a very tough challenge for community corrections to, to deal with. So in New South Wales I think it's been off the back of providing the evidence and the numbers to say what we're doing is not working and we've got to find a better way and they've, they've learnt from some behavioural insights and from CBT, cognitive behaviour therapies, mm. and doing things differently. So I think, and I think it's been reinforced in a lot of the presentations over the last two days that data, even though we're not data people, we use it to our advantage mm. all the time. And the benefit that we have in our unit is we can tell the story behind the data. We know over-representation is high. And then we've got the story of the person who's got a disability in a small town of 3,000 people that doesn't understand what police are telling him, he ends up back in court and it's a cycle. So we can really anchor that data with personal human stories about clients mm. and politicians and our executive. They love a good story um, and sometimes it really pulls at their heartstrings. So that's one of the ways in which we use the data with the stories to, to paint a picture that we need to change. Mm. And I think in terms of organisations, I have not seen a better working relationship than between Edwina and Eva um, working through what your plan challenges and troubleshooting. So Eva's part of the Behavioural Insights Unit at Department of Customer Service and Edwina is part of the Aboriginal Services Unit, Depart uh, sorry, Department of Customer Service, Department of Justice, um, two groups that might never really talk, but it's this organisational behind the scenes um, interaction that really makes a difference. Um, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just um, on the point around buying of staff and I think you picked up on this Serene. I think for, for me it's really been um, important to have that humility and I know that when I remember we were doing the first training, um, round of training for What's Your Plan, so we'd done the pilot, we were training up all the rest of the staff and we're all excited and, uh, and you know, I remember this, well, we had a lot of scepticism but I remember one particular um, frontline staff member say, oh look, Eva, I just don't think this is going to work for our people which was pretty gut-wrenching at that point because we'd come that way. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I think, yeah, like the response was just 
yeah, look, I don't know if it's going to work either. These are the reasons why we think it's worth giving it a shot. But absolutely, we're ready to pull the plug if we think it's not it's not going to work. And uh, and you know, we want your input on how we can make it better. You're the expert in client engagement, you know, and and really, you know, giving them that that empowerment. Um, and he's actually one of the our highest performers now. He's the one who's you know, we always, when we do the webinars, he's the one we wheel out with the stories about <laughs> how great What's Your Plan is. <laughs> so, um, and, yeah, and he's a massive advocate for the project now. So yeah. We've ruined them for other partners now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the other questions that we might have received here is um, how long did it take for the initial idea <laughs> through to completing implementation? Um, in our part, I mean, a little bit like what you guys did also, I, I spent a lot of time talking to the probationers, um, and they, they were incredible. Like these, I'm not sure if it's because they're younger, but they were very eager to talk. Uh, and so a lot of time was spent actually speaking to the probationers and trying to understand sort of like, you know, why they're in the situation that they're in. I don't, it, I think the, way, the reason why um, it was valuable to spend a lot of time talking with them, and that's sort of like took a chunk of the, the period of time between idea to implementation um, was that this is a group of, of kids, I think, who maybe the adults in their life, or at least with the probation officers, like, it's, it's quite a fraught relationship that they have with the probation officers. Whereas I'm I, I just like a third party. They have no idea who I am. They're just somebody who's curious about them. I don't tell them what I want to hear. Um, I just literally say, so tell me a little bit about you know, your life. How do you spend your day? Um, and often it goes into an hour long conversation about like how they spend sort of like the last two weeks of their life. Um, and because of this very rich um, interviewing process that uh, we had to undertake the, for the first trial with the WHOOP, probably took us about, um, I think six months from beginning to actually in designing the WHOOP worksheet. And then from there, it ran for another like... I, I remember it to be longer. I think we, <laughs> we approached BIT in 2017. And then I think we started the, the trial in March, was it March 2018? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was a longer process, and then uh, I think Serene had the chance to speak with the probation officers as well. Yeah. Yeah. So to understand the dynamics and how it works, and whether we could anything that we should be targeting or looking out for. So. So I, I think I mean I think from what you could hear from Irina, the the kind of engagement that goes into working in an environment that is quite special. Right, working with populations that are quite vulnerable. Um, and for me, I've not worked with young people before to this extent. And so trying to go into a context that I'm a little unfamiliar with required me to actually spend a lot more time understanding this population. And so I think that the takeaway was, if you know that you're going into a environment that is unfamiliar, really take the time to understand your stakeholders and not just the end user. So in our case, not just the probationers, but also the probation officers, right? So not just mm. the Aboriginal, not the offenders, but the people who work with the offenders. Mm. Um, they know the stakeholders more than you will. Right? And so as researchers, right, we may know the science, we might know the statistics, but we don't know the population. Uh, we don't know the users. Um, and so often when we run trials, we talk about like, oh, this is what we did, and then like, we ran the trial, and these are the statistics, we, we analyzed the results. But what you often don't hear is the kind of work that goes into understanding um, the population, really get to know them, get to know why they are the way that they are and what is the best sort of like opportunities um, to really you know, get in and help them and support them. And so I really urge you to focus less maybe on the, I know we are all under, you know, with our bosses and stuff, we're all under constraints to deliver within a certain time point. But we also want to make sure that the intervention that we design really suits your population and really addresses the needs that they have. And in order for you to do that, you need to take the time to understand. It is a little bit time intensive, it might be resource intensive. Um, you know, Karen is nodding <laughs> wisely. Um, but I think that the results that you get is so much richer as a result. Um, and so you know, if there's one takeaway, really know your end user um, and really know the people that you work with. I'm not sure if you want to add on to yeah. that. Yeah. And I think that, that goes with any kind of cultural group. I think one of the biggest um, uh, challenges that people have is how to engage um, with particular cultural groups because they might not look you in the eye or they, mm. yeah, th things like that that are really simple if you go connect with people from that community or try to find out a little bit more about how they interact and engage and communicate because sometimes when you're on the other side you, you don't think they're listening or they're not paying attention or they just want to get out but if you change the way you greet them or use a traditional greeting or um, do an acknowledgement to country like we practice uh, 
at home, it can make a huge difference to a young person when they're about to sit down and do a case management plan. So there's little, little things that you can take, cultural customs that you can learn about and incorporate into your work. I think make a huge difference in getting someone engaged because you've shown some cultural responsivity, you're, you're being respectful in that way. And I think that works really well with cultural groups, religious groups, and it, to some extent disadvantaged groups or people with mental um, health issues and cognitive impairments. There's lots of ways in which you can tailor your communication to really be effective so you can go in there and have that conversation straight away. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to end the round of the session now. It is lunchtime, so I'm going to let you guys go so we don't have to fight with your hunger pangs anymore. Um, thank you so much for spending the last hour and 15 minutes with us. Um, would you like to join me to like thank the panellists for their time? <laughs>